This morning, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 3. There will be a couple places that I kind of bounce around as well, though. But most of what we'll be covering is in Proverbs chapter 3. Lonnie, here's your uh, bulletin. Proverbs is a cool, cool book. I, uh, I love how Proverbs has 31 uh, chapters in it. It allows us to read one every day. And then I try to, like on that last day, if we only have 28 days, 29 days, whatever, I try to fit the rest of them in because Proverbs 31, I'm going to have to do one on that sometimes pretty soon too. Um, because it talks about my wife. so. But this is... Um, this was actually Jesse's idea, so thank you for this idea, dude. Um, studying for this was just fire. I loved it. First of all, Proverbs was written by... Uh, most of it was written by Solomon. And Solomon is King David's son. And I say most of it because there are at least two other authors. And uh, some people believe that as Solomon was putting a lot of this stuff together, most of it was his actual, um, his actual proverbs, his actual words of wisdom. But most people believe that some of it was probably pulled from a couple other places as well. But Proverbs chapter 3, we know, actually was written by Solomon to his son. And let me me read to you what the purpose of the book of Proverbs is. It is to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, thank you, Jesus, to the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel, to understand a proverb and mysteries, the words of the wise and their riddles. So that's the whole point of the whole book of Proverbs. So, you might ask, well, how did Solomon know all of this? In order to get to that, we have to start out in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. You can turn there if you want, but you don't necessarily have to. I'll read it, and we're going to refer back to it as well. But 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 through 14 says, Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father, David, except that Solomon, too, offered sacrifices and burned incense at the local places of worship. The most important of these places of worship was at Gibeon. So the king went, he went there and sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings. That is a whole lot of burnt offerings. That night... So he goes to Gibeon, he sacrifices a thousand burnt offerings, he's doing this in worship to the God, to our God, the one true God. He's trying to do his best to follow all of the the laws, the decrees, the, the word that King David passed down to him. He's trying to be the best king that he can possibly be. And after he sacrificed a thousand burnt offerings that night, that very night, it says, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, what do you want? Ask, and I'll give it to you. So imagine imagine you had all the money in the world, and you had a kid that just always was doing everything that they could to please you. You knew that they wanted your heart. 
They wanted to do anything and everything, and they even put themselves aside in order to do what you wanted. And you could give them anything. That's what God's doing with Solomon here. God says, what do you want? Like God doesn't, God knows what he wants, right? God, God knows our hearts, the word says. But he says, ask and I'll give it to you. Ask for it. Whatever it is that you want, ask for it. Solomon's reply here is absolutely mind-blowing, but it reveals his actual heart. He says, You showed faithful love to your servant, my father, David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued your faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Before I go too much farther, remember that King Saul or King David had a affair with Bathsheba, and that that affair led to a pregnancy. But because it was not right, it was not just, God took that son from him. The word tells us that clearly. And Solomon is the son with Bathsheba to replace that son. Because King David still was a man after God's heart. He repented. He repented. Okay? And so God gave him another son, and this is who that son is. Now he says, Now, O Lord my God, you have made me king instead of my father David, because King David died. But I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. Have any of you been there? I've been there. Like, God's put you in a calling, and you know that you're not equipped to do it. You might walk around like, on the outside, yeah, I got it all together. But on the inside, you're going, holy smokes. I cannot do this. Like, I don't have what it takes to do this, what you've called me to do. That's what Solomon is, is saying here. And he says, but I'm like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous, they can't even be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon asked for wisdom. So God replied, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, all of which would be understandable if a king would have asked for those things. You have to have riches to be able to rule a kingdom. Long life, everyone wants long life, right? But if you're going to do really well and you're going to accomplish all the plans that God has for you or the plans that you believe that He has for you, it's better to have a long life. And who knows that back then you didn't want enemies. They were constantly at battle. They were constantly at war. King David was always going off to war, sending his people off to war, and so it would have been understandable for him to ask for the death of his enemies. But God said, because you haven't asked for all these things, and you've asked for wisdom, it pleases me. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, and have not asked for long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart. A wise and understanding heart. He didn't say a wise and understanding mind. That comes along with it, but it's from your heart that you rule. And an understanding heart such as no one else has had or ever will have. That's a big deal. Like, there's a lot of really smart people in the world, but none of them compare to Solomon. He says, And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me, if you follow me and obey my decrees 
and my commands, as your father David did, I will give you a long life. That's pretty stinking awesome. So, whenever we ask, how did, how did Solomon get so wise in order to write the, the book of Proverbs? God gave it to him. God gave him the wisdom. God gave him the riches, gave him the wealth, gave him the long life, gave him peace throughout his nation the whole time that he ruled. God gave it to him. Solomon, without asking, would have not gotten. Without asking for wisdom, we wouldn't be reading Proverbs. At least not through Solomon. Maybe God would have brought somebody else. But, I do want to tell you that the book of Proverbs should be regarded as true principles and not absolute promises. Okay? There are going to be things that we address today, things that we talk about today, that we should regard as true principles, but not as absolute promises. Because we know that there are some people that are great people, that follow the Word, that, that love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and honor their parents, but yet are still taken early. Okay, so that's because it's a true principle, but it's not an absolute promise all the time. Okay, God is omniscient. He's the one that can make things happen, move things around. So, now we're going to jump into Proverbs chapter 3, and we're going to start out in verse 1. Remember, this is Solomon talking to his son, um, probably the son that he had planned on taking over the kingdom. Unfortunately, that didn't work out so well if, if you read the rest of the story. But he's talking to him and he says, My child, never forget the things that I've taught you. Store up my commands. His commands here that he's talking about are God's laws. Store up God's laws in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years. Your life will be satisfying. Why can, why can Solomon say this? He can say it because he's experienced it. Because God put it uh, into practice in his life, and God made him the most wise person ever lived. So he knows that this will happen. He says, though, he says, Store up my commands in your heart. We have to understand that, that there is a difference from your heart and your mind. But both of them, you're able to think from, to act from. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, there's so much. I could go way, way deep down into this. I probably better not here. But the heart is the first thing that wanders away from God, and it's also the first thing that returns to God. It's your heart. That's why he's saying, store these things up in your heart. Proverbs 3 says, Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. That means make them a part of your very nature. Make loyalty and kindness part of your very nature because they're part of God's nature. And we have to work toward it. We have to work uh, to that. That's why he says, bind it around your neck. If it's around your neck like a necklace, it's close to your heart, isn't it? And so constantly be thinking about that until it becomes part of who you are, until it becomes your nature, not your second nature, but your first nature. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. It won't be given to you on a silver platter. You will earn a good reputation. We have to earn it. But we earn a good reputation by loyalty and kindness. Think about anybody that you know that has a good reputation. A good reputation. Are they loyal? Do they act in kindness? Absolutely. <clears throat> then he goes on, and this... This next couple of verses, uh, five and six, everybody knows them. There's a great song out about them. 
well, maybe not everybody knows them, but if you don't know it, you should know it. Try to memorize this. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean or depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all that you do, and He will show you which path to take. But first, it starts with trust. It starts with trusting God. Not just kind of trusting Him, though. He says, trust Him with all of your heart. When it's hard, when it's difficult, when it seems like there's no end in sight, when it seems like you're up against something absolutely impossible, and there's no physical way that this could possibly happen. We have to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. He says, don't lean on your own understanding because who knows that your own understanding won't get you very far. Most of your understanding will get you a lot farther than my understanding, um, but it's still not going to get you far enough. We have to trust in Him with all of our heart. We have to seek His will. And how do we know His will? By getting into the Word by communicating with Him, by talking to Him. The word trust is actually translated, and the, the original word meant to lie helpless face down. You have to trust someone if you're going to lie helpless and face down in front of them. Trust that they're not going to hurt you. Trust that they're not going to kill you. Trust that they're not going to stab you in the back. You've got to trust that they have your best interest in mind because you can't defend yourself because you're helpless face down. That's what trust means. Solomon found that God was worthy, is worthy to be trusted. Remember, he's talking to his oldest son here who he believes is going to take over the kingdom. He's speaking this into him and he's telling him things that he has already found to be true. He's already found that God is trustworthy. There was a commentator that, that I read, and he said, he said, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Self-sufficiency and self-dependence has been the ruin of mankind ever since the fall of Adam. The grand sin of the human race is their continual endeavor to live independently of God. We see that a lot today, don't we? I mean, a whole lot today. And, you know, so many people out there will tell you, follow your heart. No, the Bible tells you don't follow your heart because it's full of wickedness and greed. It sounds good. Doesn't it sound good? Follow your heart. Do what makes you feel good. No, my friends. That's the exact opposite of the truth. The Word says that we are supposed to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after Jesus. I saw something this week that, that this pastor was saying, Jesus was the one saying this before He was crucified. Pre-crucifixion, telling them that they have to take up their cross and follow after Him. Because where they're going, they're not coming back from. There is no coming back from it. You can't follow your heart, because it's going to lead you to a place of comfort. God doesn't tell us to go to a place of comfort. He says He will be our comfort. We're supposed to run to Him and find our comfort. That He's the Prince of Peace. Right? But He tells us that we have to deny ourselves. Crucify our flesh. Don't worry about what feels good or what makes you feel good. Go after Him with all of your heart. One of the questions that Christians ask the most, and all of you have probably heard this, is how can I know God's will for my life? How can I know that I'm in God's will? Maybe people say, I can't hear Him. You know, I, I, don't, I, I can't guarantee that what I'm hearing is Him. Well, in principle, Solomon literally lays it out and gives us a great way to understand 
and determine if we're in God's will. And it's this. When we decide to put our trust in the Lord, that's one. When we decide to not trust in our own understanding, but give attention and priority to God's revealed Word, that's two. And then, when we decide to acknowledge and honor God in all that we do, we can go forward in peace, believing that through His Word, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, through the wise counsel of others, through godly common sense, and through life circumstances, God will direct our path. One day, I think that we're all going to look back, especially if we're putting these things into practice, we will look back and we'll see that we've been on the path God had intended for us all along. Doesn't that seem, I mean, I know you're probably thinking, I don't know that this was God's will for my life. I don't know that that was God's will for my life. Guys, I've made tons of really bad, horrible mistakes. Bad ones. You know what has happened through those? I've learned some really good lessons of what to not ever do again. So even the hard times, even the things that seem difficult for us, that we're like, there's no way that that could have been God's will. Please understand that sometimes, even if you relate it to raising children, sometimes you have to let them do things that hurt them so that they will learn because sometimes they don't listen to us, do they? Can I not get an amen? <laughs> Seriously, though, God knows that some of us, like me, are hard-headed. That was probably louder than it probably should have been. <laughs> but sometimes we do. We have to learn the hard way. In verse 7 and 8, it says, Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Oh man, that's, some good, that's a good word right there. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. He says turn away from evil because we're going to face evil. Evil's going to come to our door. It's going to come and try to meet us face to face. He says turn away from it though. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. That's big news. Some of us want to be healed. You know, the Word tells us multiple different ways that we can be healed. Confess your sins to one another so that you can be healed. We look here and it says um, to not try to go after our own wisdom. You know, going after our own wisdom sometimes can cause those physical ailments. You know, I mean, doing things that I've wanted to do has really damaged this body a lot. But he says, instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then we'll have healing for our bodies and strength for our bones. If we go on to verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. What does this word honor mean? I want you to think about that. Solomon's telling his son, honor the Lord with your wealth and the best part of everything that you produce. The best part, not the last, not the stuff that's okay, but you know what, I can do without it. You know, to honor him with everything that you produce. So let's think about some of the things that we produce. Our relationships. We need to honor the Lord with our relationships, with our friendships, the people that we choose to be friends with. Are we honoring God in those relationships when we get together, when we hang out, whenever it's just us and the guys? Are we still representing Christ? Are we still acting the way that we would if Jesus, if, if He in bodily form is standing right next to you? With our spouses... Are we honoring Him with the best part of our relationship with our spouses, with the best part of our relationship with our kids? I know that unfortunately, there's been so many times where my kids have got the leftover Nathan, 
the whatever's left, Nathan. The whenever I'm not so tired, Nathan. The I'm on the verge of snapping, Nathan. But he's saying honor him even in those relationships. Kids with parents, honor him with the way that we treat them. The Word also tells us that if we honor our parents, we will have a long life. Some of you have clearly honored your parents. That didn't go over as well as I thought it would. We need to honor him with the best part of our relationship with our co-workers. That's a tough one. With our relationships with strangers. To honor him with the best part of our work. Galatians 3.3, I believe it is, says to do everything. Everything that you do, work as though you are working unto the Lord. That honors Him. Honor Him with the best part of our speech and our attitude. Some of these, they're really for me, guys. I put them on air for me. But it says, Then He will fill your barns with grain, and your vats will overflow with good wine. Well, not all of us are farmers today, right? Not all of us make wine. But it's not just talking about that. It's talking about He will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory. That's what He's talking about here. Everything that you need. But remember, and you might want to highlight this in in your Bible, Luke chapter 6, Verse 38. This is very important. He says, Give and you will receive. But you got to keep in mind, it's whatever it is that you give is what you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more and running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will will be the measure in which you get back. Guys, I think that this is only talking about money a very teeny tiny little bit. It's true, the principle still applies, but it also applies as if you give a crappy attitude to somebody, you're going to get it back in the same measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over into your lap. If you have a good attitude, if you're happy, that's what you're going to get in return. If you give of your time and you are helping people out, you're going to get that in return. You're going to get the good stuff back. You're going to get the bad stuff back. It's just one of God's principles. So we have to be cautious about what it is that we're giving out, right? And we have to honor God with everything that we do, the best of our first fruits. It says, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. And don't be upset when He corrects you. For the Lord corrects those that He loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom He delights. It doesn't say, in whom He doesn't delight in, in whom He doesn't like. He's saying, He corrects just like He does a child that He loves. We have to accept God's correction. And correction is sometimes tough, you know? It, it hurts. Like, that's the whole point. So you learn from it, right? We grow, we're, we're living in a, in a day and age where people don't spank their kids anymore. They have no consequences for their actions. And guys, this is, it's, I'm seeing it all over the place, man. It is reaping havoc all over the world. But it's because these parents... They don't want to discipline. They don't want to be the bad guy. They don't want to cause pain, whatever it is. Guys, literally the Word tells us that if we don't discipline our children, it's the same as hating them. That's pretty insane. That's intense. But he says the Lord corrects those he loves. Then he goes on and he says, 
Joyful is the person who finds wisdom, the one who gains understanding. Those people are going to have joy. They're going to have joy. For wisdom is more profitable than silver, and her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing that you desire can compare with her. Nothing. No earthly thing that you think that you want is going to bring you as much happiness, joy, peace, as wisdom and understanding. She offers you long life in her right hand and riches and honor in her left. How can he possibly say this? How can he say that wisdom and understanding will provide you long life and riches and honor? Because when he asked for wisdom in 1 Kings 3, verses 12 through 14, tells us that whenever he asked for wisdom, he received long life whenever he obeyed, and he received riches and honor. That's how he can say this. He's like, because it happened to me, so I know that it's a, a true principle. It says, she will guide you down delightful paths. All of her ways are satisfying. Why, why can that be? It's because if you don't know where you're going, if you're lost and you're confused, then you're always struggling with feelings of anxiousness and worry and, you know, like you just don't know what's next. So how can you be at peace? How can you be going down delightful paths if you have no wisdom and understanding? If you're not willing to receive wise counsel, if you're not willing to ask God for wisdom. Wisdom is the tree of life to those who embrace her. Happy are those who hold her tightly. I like that they called wisdom her there and held her tightly. I'm looking at my wife. For those of you watching online, she is my wisdom a lot of the times. So thank you, Lord. By wisdom, the Lord founded the earth. He, by understanding, He created the heavens. By His knowledge, the deep fountains of the earth burst forth, and the dew settled beneath the night sky. All of those things happened by God's wisdom and his understanding. By his knowledge, he brought all these things forth. Guess what? There wasn't a Big Bang, unless when he said these things, it sounded like a Big Bang. <laughs> you know? That's the only way. He's the one that created the world. The world. He's the one that created the foundations, and he did it through wisdom. He says, My child, don't lose sight of common sense and discernment, hang on to them. Don't you know that common sense is generally not a common virtue anymore? Unfortunately, it's not. But common sense comes from living a disciplined life, from watching other people's mistakes and trying your best to not make those same mistakes, learning from them. He says, hang on to common sense and discernment, for they will refresh your soul. They are like jewels on a necklace. They're beautiful. They keep you safe on your way, and your feet will not stumble. If you just use a little common sense and have some discernment, listen to God. Whenever the Holy Spirit, you know, the Word tells us that the Holy Spirit leads us. The Holy Spirit guides us. He directs us. But we have to listen we have to want to hear it in order to hear it, right? He goes on and he says, this is in verse 24, he says, You can go to bed without fear. You will lie down and sleep soundly. You need not be afraid of sudden disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked, for the Lord is your security. He will keep your foot from being caught in a trap. We're going through a, a huge, uh, I don't know, epidemic, I guess, of people that can't sleep, you know? And most of the time it's because we have our faces in these tablets and phones and all that stuff, you know? But then it says that you'll lie down and sleep soundly. 
if God is your security. It says you won't be afraid of sudden disaster or the destruction that comes upon the wicked. You know, no matter what happens to us, if your faith and your hope and your trust is in God, we know where we're going. There's no need to be afraid. Even if the worst thing happens, you know, we die. This body dies. Even if that disaster happens, we win. <laughs> we still come out on top, no matter what the death is even like, you know, because he's our security. And this life is just but a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. He goes on and he says, this is, this is some good advice. He says, don't withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. If you can help somebody, help them. He doesn't even put any parameters on it. He just says, if you can help, help. It's the right thing to do. It's the good thing to do. Do you remember the uh, parable that Jesus told about the good Samaritan? You know, that person, they didn't even really like each other. But it was in his power to help. And so he helped. Solomon is telling him, this is good practice. Because what goes around comes around. What you reap, you will sow. If you want people to treat you well, you better do it. What's up, baby? If you sow, you will reap. Thank you. Thank you. See? That's my second Holy Spirit. I knew she did a hand signal. I'm like, I must have messed something up. Because we've been married 20 years. I, see how I pick up on that? You can pick up on it. It took me 19 years to pick up on it. If you help your neighbor now, um, if you can help your neighbor now, don't say come back tomorrow and then I'll help you. If you can do it now, help now. My neighbor helps out all the time, even whenever it's not beneficial for him. Like he'll stop whatever he's doing. It's like, dude, you can stop, you can finish what you're doing. He's like, no, let's, let's get it done. He literally lives this. And then it says, don't plot harm against your neighbor for those who live nearby trust you. Don't pick a fight without a reason. Notice that he didn't say don't pick a fight at all. He said don't pick a fight without a reason. When no one has done you harm. Solomon, he had probably one of the largest military forces in the, in the world at that time. He developed a massive army. But still... He's like, don't pick a fight for no reason. That's why he lived in peace. You know, he put all of these things to practice. So he didn't have to go out and pick fights um, in the spring whenever all the kings went out to war. He didn't need to do that. And then he says, this is super, super important, guys. He says, don't envy violent people or copy their ways. Such wicked people are detestable to the Lord, but he offers his friendship to the godly. We can be friends with God. We are his sons and his daughters, but he offers us friendship. Like we're literally, we're buds, you know? We get to hang out with him. He offers us friendship. The Lord curses the house of the wicked. And believe me, you don't want God to curse your house. But he blesses the home of the upright. The Lord mocks the mockers, but is gracious to the humble. This the Lord mocks the mockers. It reminds me of, I don't know if you guys have ever watched any like uh, UFC fights, ultimate fighting championships, or like boxing matches or anything, but have you ever seen somebody that is um, arrogant in the ring? They're in the ring matched up with somebody that's probably pretty good, at least as good as they are, because they want a good fight, right? But then you have these arrogant people that are taunting them and dancing around the ring, and they get knocked out. <laughs> I love it. It's like, you earned it, you earned it, you know? Like, <laughs> you can't feel bad. I mean, it probably does feel bad, but you earn that. And it says, the Lord mocks the mockers, but, gives it, but is gracious to the humble. It says that God himself opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble people. 
We need to be humble. And sometimes it's very, very difficult, you know? Um, especially if you're dealing with somebody that you feel like, maybe you feel like that, that you have more good sense than they do. Maybe you feel like that you know better than they do or whatever. Sometimes God just says, you know what? Humble yourself or I'm going to humble you. And this is speaking from experience, okay? And I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we can probably just about everybody say, yeah, I, I can see that. I've lived that. It says, the wise inherit honor, but fools are put to shame. Notice the, the over, and uh, the repetition, because he wants his son to get this. It's very, very important that he understands this. <clears throat> James 1, verse 5, is also another outstanding verse that I think that we all should try to memorize. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. I love here that, that James specifically throws in without finding fault. He's saying that God will give you wisdom, will give you understanding, if you ask without finding fault, because we all know that when we go to ask for anything from God, Satan's back here saying, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. You've done this. You did that. Why would God give you this? God can't trust you with that, right? So James throws in there, without finding fault, because he's the brother of Jesus. He knows. He was the, literally the leader of the church in Jerusalem. For a reason. He had a very deep, intimate, personal relationship with God. And he, he himself, being a brother of Jesus, this applies so much to him because do you remember whenever Jesus walked the earth? That his own family, his brothers, didn't believe that he was who he said he was. On multiple occasions, they made fun of him. On multiple occasions, they tried to get him to stop doing what he was doing saying what he was saying. Or, at one point, they were going to Jerusalem for a feast. And it's right before Jesus um, goes to be crucified and all that stuff. Right after Lazarus is raised from the dead, they're saying, are you going to the feast? And Jesus says, eh, not yet. And they're like, well, you're supposed to be the Messiah. Don't you think you should go? And, and that's where everybody's going to be. You should go and and do all these miracles in front of everybody so they'll believe. And literally, if you go back and read the text, they were mocking him. That's what they were doing. So James, later, whenever he writes this, I think that that was a personal thing for him, knowing that God didn't find fault in me whenever I asked for wisdom and he gave it to me, even though I mocked my brother, who just happens to be the Messiah. It says that he will give it to you. He will give it to you. I pray that all of us will try to take Solomon's words to heart. He lived it. He experienced it. And God gave us these words for our benefit. To benefit our lives, to benefit those around us and to show His love and his, who He is, His character. You know, the Word says that we're created in the image and in the likeness of God, and He wants us to walk in His authority. He wants us to walk in His humility, that even though Jesus had every right to come and walk around and, and command people to serve Him, He still served everybody else. Everybody else. How much more should we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I do pray that you will pour out your wisdom and your knowledge and your understanding into all of us, Lord. 
I pray that we will open up our hearts and our minds to your Holy Spirit, that you will be able to um, move in us and through us, God, that you will accomplish with us what you want to accomplish with us, God. I pray that we will set ourselves aside, that we will lay down our lives, that we will crucify ourselves, and that it's no longer us that lives, but you that live in us, God. Help our minds to absorb the wisdom that you want us to have so that we can walk in a way that is is glorifying and pleasing to you, God, with everybody that we meet, with everything that we do, even in our own personal time, whenever it seems like nobody's looking and nobody's around, God. Help us to honor you even then, Lord. Help us to make walking this way a lifestyle and part of us, who we are. Lord, I pray that we will not only have this wisdom, God, but that you will put it in us so that we will go out and we will be obedient to you, Lord, and we will change the world for you. That we will bring glory and honor to your name and to the name of the Father. Lord, I pray that people will know who we are related to you by the way that we treat one another. Lord, help us where where we are weak. Make us strong, God. I pray that you will go out before us today, wherever we're going, whatever that we do, Lord, I pray that you will help us to impact our area of influence. Make us brave, God. Help us to be brave. Lord, thank you for your willingness to work with even us to work with even me, God. We love you. We cherish you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.